Okay, uh, good morning. Being that um, lately in the news there seems to be a uh, predominant amount of talk about anti-Semitism. Well, there's different statements coming from uh, politicians or, uh, or uh, different uh, attitudes in England and in Europe. Now, some people wondering whether anti-Semitism is on the rise or even attacks in this community that seem to be uh, racist-based. So I've been having a lot of questions, people asking me what, what is the, the Rebbe's approach to anti-Semitism. And being that we're also just a week, a little more, a week from Purim, next week, next Thursday, I thought that um, it would be good to speak, about, speak exactly about that. <clears throat> and you may be surprised the Rebbe's approach to it is very different than you'd usually hear. So I'll um, sum it up. And it's primarily based on a fabringen, a talk the Rebbe gave. Purim Tavshin Chavhei. That would mean Purim 1965. So a number of years ago, what is that? Uh, how many years ago is that? 60, 50, uh, 54 years ago. So it was on Purim and connected to the story of Purim which maybe is the most uh, actually documented narrative in history of uh, institutionalized anti-Semitism. <clears throat> so even though Pari and Mitzrayim, you could say, was the first real um, institutional governmental uh, oppression of the Jews, but Frankly, the story of Purim is actually much more similar to Rahman al the story of Hitler and the Nazis. Because Haman said exactly what Hitler said. And that is that Lahashmid Laabid to destroy and kill every Jew. Pari didn't go ahead and kill all the Jews. Many Jews were killed. But it was more bondage and slave labor, slaves. But but Haman decree, which approved by Achishvedish, was to destroy all the Jews. Huh? Where do you find that? Huh? He destroyed the base of Israel, but he didn't destroy the Jews. The Jewish people. Yeah. He targeted to kill the entire Jewish people. The, the Romans also destroyed. I mean, every nation we were at. But the place, Haman actually made the statement that to kill all the Jews. Not in Hanukkah, not anywhere else do you find that. So. There's a lot that can be learned from the story of the Megillah of Purim. And the Rebbe does that in that year, Tav Shem So here's a, a short summary. It's a long talk that Rebbe gave. You can listen to it. It's on tape. It's also been written down, of course. Um, but it's a very fascinating talk about exactly this topic. So just the story everybody knows. Uh, what really enraged Haman, of all things, is when Mordechai refused to bow to him. Right? And when Haman saw that everybody else was bowing to him and Mordechai refused, that enraged him. That was like the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. <clears throat> and that's when he went. Tachashvedish has said the famous line that um, among your 127 nations in your empire, there's Yeshna Amechod. Mufuzim are faded by Ha'amim. They're spread and sent all over your empire, meaning Jews in all the countries. Remember, Achashvedish ruled from Haidu to Kush. You know where those countries are? Haidu is India, and Kush is Ethiopia. So on the map today, it would be everything from the Indian, in the country called India, the whole Middle East, all the way to Eastern Africa. That was basically where he ruled, the Persian Empire. And he said there are many Jews, that's where all the Jews lived actually then. The Jews had either lived in Israel or they lived in Bovel, because after the Churm Bayesishan, Purim of course happened between the two Beis Amigdash. So the, where all the Jews were essentially was that area. 
So he said, this nation is spread all over your, many nations, among all your, and their religion, their faith, is different than everybody else. That's what bothered them. They're different. They stand out. And as such, I'm ready to pay you money to have them all killed. And Achishwede's answer responds to him, keep your money, you can kill them anyway. Because I also don't want them. And that's when he threw the girdle, and it came out in the month of Adar, which he was, made him very happy, because that was the month where Moshe Rabbeinu passed away. And that was it. So you can imagine, if you're living through those times, exactly like the Nazi decree of the final solution, to kill every last Jew. Anoshim, Noshim v'taf. And the miracle was that it all turned around. Instead of being a day of genocide and complete disaster, it ended up being a day that the Jews celebrated and survived and thrived and killed their enemies. But what was this exact exchange between Haman and Achashverosh? What's going on here? You know, everyone wonders, was Achashverosh also an anti-Semite? Or was he a fool and he was just manipulated by Haman? And there are different opinions on the matter. Some say he was worse than Haman. But he was smart. He like um, didn't show it. He let Haman do the dirty work. Some say Haman was worse. And Achishverosh was manipulated. was a tippish. And some say Achishverosh was a fachvach. He was a confused person. One day like this, one day like that. One day he can convince him this, and Esther convinced him the other way around. But regardless of what he was, there's no question he wasn't exactly a tzaddik. Because he had, he had agreed... And that was the story. And once the decree was passed, they needed a second decree to reverse it. So here's the Gemara the Rebbe touched upon in that Purim Fabreng. A, a very strange Gemara. The Gemara says, here's an example for Haman Achashverosh and Haman's exchange and their personalities. And the example is of, of two people who had a piece of land. Two people owned, like farmers, they owned a piece of land. One of them had in his land a mound of dirt. They owned the same no, different land. One, um, and, and one of them had, this is the Gemara in Dafya Dalad, Ahmed Aleph in Megillah, the Masech to Megillah. One of them had a land, he had an extra piece, a mound of dirt that irked him. He didn't want to have it. He didn't need it. The second one, that's called the Bala Tal. Tal is a, is a mound. There was a Bala Chritz, an owner of another piece of land, and he had a Chritz. A Chritz is a ditch, a hole in the ground. And he didn't want that. And he saw his neighbor, or he saw the other person has a mound, he thought to himself, how nice it would be if I could pay him for that dirt and I fill up my ditch. And the person who had the mound felt the same thing. He said, how nice would it be if I can give him my dirt, get rid of my dirt and fill up his ditch. So what happened? The guy that had the the ditch went to the one that had the mound and said to him, I'm ready to pay you for your dirt. You don't need it. It's extra. I need it. I want to fill up my mound. My ditch, I'm sorry. And he said to him, no, you don't have to pay me. I don't want it. I don't need this dirt. It's just a nuisance for me. So take it and fill up your ditch, and we'll all be happy. And this is Homon and Achashverosh. Achashverosh had the mound, and Homon had the ditch. So the Rebbe obviously asked the most basic question, what is this Moshul exactly? What's missing in the story that you need a Moshul altogether? You know, you usually give an example when something's not clear. What's not clear here? And what does the Moshul really come to teach us? What is this mound? And the, the mound, you could say, okay, the Jewish people, for him, was a nuisance. They stood out like a mound. He didn't want them. But what is the ditch? And by filling the, or the, the mound and ditch doesn't get rid of the Jews. He wanted to kill the Jews. He wanted to get rid of the Jews altogether. How is putting the mound's dirt in the ditch going to help? Well, if you're still alive in the Jews and they're putting the Jews into the ground, it's like, you already killed all of them, so better, yeah. Like I'm saying, it's going to be simple. But he wanted to kill them, which means that they won't be anymore. If they don't there anymore, they'll just have a ditch left. Okay. And more questions the Rebbe asks. And the Rebbe's response, as I said, it's pretty elaborate. I'll try to sum it up in the best way possible. And here's the Nukud, here's the point. The Rebbe said the relationship between Jews and Goyim 
which is a complex relationship that we've had from the beginning of history, there seems to be a paradox. And this Gemara is coming to explain the paradox. Because Haman and are symbolic, not just of what happened then, but over the history, Jews always had a tense relationship with their Jewish hosts, with their non-Jewish hosts. On one hand, we're told that you have to be mispal, pray for the good welfare of the government in which you live. Our job is not to fight with them. Our job is not to um, go to war, but to somewhat placate them, somewhat be at peace with them. And we actually have dinim that we're supposed to not, you're not allowed to steal from a guy. There are a lot of things that you're supposed to do for peaceful interaction, peaceful coexistence. On the other hand, we're told, you bring it in Tanya even right in the beginning, chesed um, lo'umim chatos. That chesed of umim, which means even the kindness nations do to us, always has another agenda. Don't trust it. You can't rely on them. And there's a whole bunch of stories. I'm not going to go through all the details that ever brings Mitzrayim and Bovel Taka and Asher and other non-Jewish um, empires who even when they showed kindness, the Nevi'im and the leaders of the Jewish people said, be careful. Because they said it's like leaning on, they actually gave an example of leaning on a support that has no real support. Imagine leaning on something like cardboard. You think it's going to support you, but when you lean on it, it's going to fall down. You can't depend on their kindness. So how do you reconcile these two attitudes? To, well, let me add one more thing. And, and to the extent, going back to the first point, not only are we supposed to coexist with Goyim, we're also supposed to influence them. There's a whole din in the Rambam, in Teira, that we have to spread and inspire them with the Sheva Mitzvah's Bnei Neach. On the other hand, you can't trust them. So how does it work? So the Rebbe explained, the fact of the matter is that from the time of Esau and Yaakov, there's a, there's a rule. The Kalal he be a dua that Esau sein al Yaakov. There's an inherent hatred of the nations of the world to the Jewish people. And it's not based on any reason. It's not like if you do something, they won't hate you. It's an inherent distrust. I'll elaborate a bit. What is the distrust based on? The trust is based on because the nations of the world represent the secular material world. And the Jews, what makes them unique is that they were chosen by God to bring goodness to this world. What, why was Avram such a threat to Nimrod and to his people and to his uh, culture? Because he stood up and said, life is not just about me, me, me. It's about being kind and compassionate. And that was considered sacrilegious in a world, a pagan world, that was a selfish world. So Avram Avinu stu- f- stood up for values that the world wasn't interested in. When you're living in a world everybody's interested in me, me, my money, my power, my control, a person like that who's altruistic, who's giving, who's benevolent, is a threat. There's a fundamental tension between Elam Haza, basically, this material world, and the spiritual world. The Jews represent the spiritual world, and the non-Jews, the material world. And that is the reason you can't rely on them. That doesn't mean, however, the Abish to put us in this world. He didn't keep us in Gan Eden and say, I'll keep a neshama separate from this material world. He sent the neshama down to this physical world, a hostile world, and said you have to contend with and cha- the challenges of a physical world and nations that will despise you, that will fight with you. Like what do we say? Yaakov and Esav in the mother's womb even, in Rivka's womb, these twin brothers were already struggling. That's why Rivka had such a difficult pregnancy. And she said to Hashem, why, am I, why is it so difficult? He says, because you have two nations inside of you. They're both struggling with each other, wrestling. And when this one rises, this one will fall. And when this one rises, this one will fall. Why can't they coexist? Because Esau represents a warrior. Ish Said, Yedid Melchama. Yedid Said, Ish Melchama, Yedid Said. He's a warrior, a hunter. What does that mean? He's busy hunting in this world. He's a warrior, he's an aggressive warrior to conquer land, money, power, and so on. What's Yaakov's description? Ishtam Yeshev Aholim, a simple person, a wholesome person who sits in the tents and learns Torah all day. So think of it, one person who's out there is an aggressive business person. 
We're not even talking evil necessarily, but he's a materialistic one. And the other one is a scholar learning and sitting in the yeshiva, learning in davening. So you can imagine there's going to be a tension between the two. And this tension translates into the nations and the Jewish people. And therefore, there's an ongoing tenuousness, meaning that they don't get along. However, the Abish just said, go into this world and work with it. I'm not telling you to go to war with the nations. You have to always be wary, know behind the scenes where they come from. But you have to go into the world and work with them. I'm not just telling you, I'll give you brachas, you have to work with goyim, make parnosa, be kind, and whatever you can, but never think that it's your ingenuity and your palp- and plans that are going to make peace with the non-Jews. It's because my bracha will protect you. And then, go deal with them. It's like we learn in Chassidus, you learn all the time. If we have betachin in Hashem, and everything is trust in God, everything will work out. Why do we have to go to work? Why do we have to make a parnasa? Why don't we just sit in Davin and Hashem will send us brachas? Because the Pasuk says, The same Hashem that says, have trust in me, said, I'm giving you kalim, I'm giving you seichel, and midis, intelligence and tools and resources and skills. To use them, my blessing will come through your actions. Not just through blind trust. Trust means that even when it doesn't work out, we still trust. But someone to say, I'm not going to make a shtadlus, I'm not going to make an effort to find a shidduch, or I'm not going to make an effort to find parnasa, I'm not going to make an effort if God forbid there's an illness, I'm not going to go to a doctor. I trust God. Why do I have to go to a doctor? Why would I have to say, Misha Beidach? Hashem will take care of everything. Because the same Hashem said, Yes, I, I, I will take care, but I bless you through your efforts. And your efforts are the keli that you need for me to bestow my blessings upon you. So therefore, the reason we interact with non-Jews and we try to be nice with them and we behave and we work with them in every possible way because hateva, that's the way we're subject to the laws of nature. But never think you are controlled by nature. It's not nature that controls you. So when Bar Kochva the Rebbe says, brought, said, I don't need Hashem. I can go deal with the nations myself. I'm smart enough, I'll negotiate with them. That was his undoing. So the Rebbe says, what's wrong with saying that? Hashem put us in this world. He told us to use our seichel. He's going to negotiate with the non-Jews. Yeah, but you have to know the Jewish people are not subject to nature. The only reason you're doing natural means and you're going to negotiate is because that's why Hashem wants it. Not because they really have power over you. And not because they ever love you. So there's a fundamental anti-Semitism that's there. And we have to do everything possible still to be good with the nations. Look, we live in a country like the United States today. The United States is actually a benevolent nation. And we do depend on their chesed. But we always know that's because Hashem blessed this country and blessed us. But it's not because the country happens to be nice people, so we're dependent. It's because Hashem ultimately, through the years and years of work and mitzvahs, the world became more refined. So there are nations that are chesed um Elam, and they're kind. That's because Hashem's blessing, not because they're nice people. They may also be nice people, and we do work with them. We work with the government, we pay taxes, we do everything, a person, a Jew, is supposed to cooperate and work together, he's subject to the laws of the land, unless the land says that you should break mitzvahs. But, if, but we're supposed to listen to the laws. We're subject to the laws. Nowhere does it say, hey, you're not supposed to listen to the laws because you're a Jewish people and you're not subject to the laws of the country. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the story in how you reconcile that. Now, what's the story with Haman and Mordechai? And, I'm sorry, Haman and Achashverosh in the context of this. So therefore, there's two sides to it. If a Jew starts thinking, you know what? I'm going to ingratiate myself to a non-Jew, and that way he won't, he won't hate me as much. Let's say, for example, Mordechai, he comes, instead of um, not bowing, he bows to, to Haman. What's the big thing? I'll give an example. Let's say you're working in a law firm or you're working in a business. And everybody respects the boss. Everybody gives a bow to him. And one Jew decides, I don't want to bow to him. And everyone else comes to him and says, why are you making trouble? Everyone's doing it. What's the big thing? If you do it, he'll be nice to us. That would be giving in and saying that it's my cheshbenus, my calculations and my ingenuity is going to make peace with the non-Jew. Says the Gemara, no, that's not the case. The non-Jew is always going to have an element of despise to not to Jews. Sometimes they'll be nice, sometimes they won't be. But don't think it's your plan. When Mordechai told Esther 
to go to Achashverosh, that was the Derech HaTeva. But what did Esther say the first thing in the Megillah? She didn't say, I'm going to figure out, the Rebbe actually uses these words. I'm going to go to a beauty parlor, the Rebbe said those words. I'll beautify myself, I'll come to Achashverosh, and I'll seduce him, and convince him not to kill my people. That's not what happened. She said, let's fast three days, which made her not exactly appealing. When you fast, you don't look so great. And they davened. And she told Mordechai, the Rebbe said, instead of going to a beauty parlor and doing whatever it can to ingratiate herself to Achishvedish and try to win him over, she went to Altarov. That was the Rebbe's words. To old rabbi. His name was Mordechai. Mm-hmm. Why? Because she knew that the essence of what Jewish people keep them alive is not your plans. So he said, why do you have to go to Achishvedish? Because the Abishta wants that know that it comes from me. I will protect you. But you need to do your effort as much as possible. But that's how I want it. So it was not so the key balance here is the thin line is you're not dependent on those efforts, but God Hashem wants us to do those efforts. So now going back to the Gemara. So the Rebbe says, What is the Gemara telling us? The Gemara is telling us, don't think that you're going to make a plan and you're going to figure out. The Rebbe uses these words you cannot eat kosher. You're going to decide to go to parties that the Goyim have, like the Jews went to Achashverosh's party. You're going to dress like the Goyim do. You're going to assimilate. And you know, you know what? You won't stand out. So the non-Jews will say, great, we won't, we, we'll, we won't hate you anymore. No, that's not the case. No matter what you do, they will not accept your assimilation. You see it, for example, with Hitler. It made no difference how assimilated a Jew was. Even if a Jew wanted to baptize himself, still killed so know that there is, there is a fundamental tension. You have to always know that. And there's two reasons why the non-Jews dislike us. One is Achashverosh's reason, and the second, the deeper one, is Haman's reason. Achashverosh said, I had a mound. I have a mound. I have an empire. I have millions and millions of subjects. And here, suddenly it's a mound, some people that stand out. They look different. They dress different. They behave differently. So it's a mound. It's like, a, it's like having a pimple on your face. Literally. A mound. It's a nuisance. That was uh, that was One of anti-Semitism is that Jews stand out. We don't need them. They just, like a, uh, like a sore thumb, they stick out. They're always different. They're always making noise. And let's, we, let's, let, we, let's get rid of that. That's one route. Uh, Hellman's reason was even deeper. A deep insecurity. A chritz. A ditch. He felt, as soon as he saw Jews, he knew there's something about them that makes them special. And that couldn't stand that. You know, it's like when you see someone who's superior to you, you don't like it. It makes you feel inferior. So his reason to want to get the Jews, rid of the Jews was not just a nuisance, was because it made him feel that we are inadequate. Here's a people whose values come from Har Sinai, whose values are about chesed, about zdokeh, values that Muhammad was not a fool. He was a very wise man. He was a scholar. And he saw it as being like, oh, you know, they're always going to be the top of the class. And that makes me feel inadequate. So for him, it was a chritz. It was a ditch. It was like a hole in his heart. And that's what bothered him. And that really is the deeper root for anti-Semitism. Achas may or may not have understood that. Maybe he was not as wise. So for him, it was more that they stood out. So what did Haman come? Comes to Achas and say, look, these Jews make us feel inadequate. They think they're special. They stand out in that way. So I want you to, I'll pay you money for you to give me them and I will get rid of them. By getting rid of them, there no longer will be a ditch. There'll no longer be a hole. If you get rid of the competition, like they say, kill the messenger. Kill the competition. Like in business, many people say, why do I have to try better and dig deeper and become greater let me just kill the competition. So even if I have a mediocre product, I already stand out. Obviously, it's not a healthy approach. So instead of Homan, and, the, and Homan who represented a shita by the nations, why don't you rise to the occasion? If you see the Jews are so superior in their, quali- in their value system and in their belief system, become like that. Don't become a Jew, but live also up to God's rules. No, that was a la- they, they were too lazy for that. Much easier, just get rid of them and that way, we, they don't, we, we, there's no more of this ditch. So that's what he said to Hashredish. To Give me this mound of people, these people that stand out in your eyes. I will, with that, get rid of them, and that way I will get rid of the inadequacy. That's what a lot of insecure people do. Instead of trying to compete and grow, 
Let me just get rid of the other. You ever hear people who argue? Like, you know, you, there's an expression they say, secure people can disagree with you. I don't have to agree with you. I don't have to, I don't, I don't have to agree with you. I'm sorry. I, 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 I don't, a secure person can find someone that disagrees with them and they don't feel disturbed by it. Why do, I, why, do, why do I have to eliminate your opinion because I disagree with it? But insecure people cannot handle another opinion because they're not so secure in their own position. So they're always looking, you have to eliminate the other. Secure people, no problem, coexistence. We could have 10 different opinions. So Haman's approach was the insecure approach. Instead of living up to a high standard, let's just get rid of the competition, let's get rid of anything that makes us feel weak or inadequate, and we're solved. What did Achishverish answer? I don't need, you don't need to pay me. I hate them too, for a different reason. I hate them because they just stand out, and I don't like their, uh, their, 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 their obtrusiveness, and they're all over the place. So he said, do it without, I'll give it to them, to you, without money. So what you hear from the Gemara is really talking about number one, that no matter what you do, this one's always going to see you as a mound, and this one will always see you as a ditch, a ditch in themselves, and inadequacy, and there's nothing you can do. Had Mordechai not bowed to Haman, yeah, maybe that day he would have been nice and happy. But the next day he wouldn't have been. He would have found something else, because he did not like the Jews. It wasn't Mordechai's not bowing was why he didn't like. That just brought the point home. That drove the point home that everybody bows to me, and here's one man that serves God. But it wasn't that was the event. That was the whole, that was one aspect of it. Because why, why would he go ahead and go kill all the Jews because one man doesn't want to bow to him? Because he knew the Jewish people do not bow to things, to men and to man-made objects. By us, we only have one God. And that made a ditch. And that's why he, the ditch in his heart, it's the chritz, the ditch, and therefore that's what drove him. So number one, we have to know when it comes to anti-Semitism, the Rebbe's lessons are. Number one, don't think that you can come up with some new novel idea that if I hide that I'm Jewish or I uh, bribe the non-Jew or I ingratiate myself or I do all kinds of, I go dance through uh, hoops and, what are they called? Um, you know, I'm going to go through all kinds of motions that I'm going to satisfy the non-Jew. That's not going to happen. It may have help for a moment. Our, we are a nation that's Lamayla Meteva. We're here, 14 and a half million Jews. Kivsa Achaz Ben Shivim Zevim. One Kivsa, one lamb, 70 wolves. Show me a lamb that can survive with 70 wolves. You think the lamb starts going through tricks and tries to make believe it's not a lamb, the wolves will suddenly say, oh, you know what, we won't eat you? No. The reason we're alive today is because Hashem wants us here. Not because we were so smart and we manipulated the Goyim. Because as we say in Hivahisha Amda, then other people, other nations that we mentioned, and of course Haman, and, and the Nazis. That makes no difference. In Europe, in Nazi Europe, most of the Jews were actually assimilated. They weren't mostly religious Jews, so it had nothing to do with how religious they were. So we need to know that we're here in this world because Hashem wants us to be here. Yet, at the same time, Hashem said, I want you to make Ishtadlus and influence the Goyim. Teach them what you learn. Teach them about the Sheva Mitzvahs. Teach them to be Chesed and Tzedek and Yesher. And teach them. As a matter of fact, this country, if you read the books, there are books that describe how the nation, founding fathers of this country built their principles that all men are created equal. And everyone has inalienable rights. The Bill of Rights, the rights that we have in this country, they built it on Torah principles. There's actually a few books that talk about it very directly, quoting their letters that they did not build it on Christian principles. They call it Teda, the metaphysics of Teda. So that's what you should do. Influence the non-Jewish people. Teach them. But never think that it's your efforts alone that are going to keep you alive. The reason that, that Esther ultimately prevailed was not because she was so beautiful and she figured out. She did that. It was because they daven to Hashem and they got the children to say the psukim. Plus the effort made. So you should always know there's going to be that element. You're either going to stand out or you're going to make non-Jews feel inadequate. And the solution there is not to fake not being Jewish, not to hide it, but on the contrary. To stand up because no difference. It's not going to make a difference. Stand up for what you believe. And the more you stand up for what you believe, the more they'll respect you and the more you'll actually change them. And then there'll be the day that they will no no longer be anti-Semitism because they will learn from you what God wants, how to be 
like as I said, America is a great experiment of a country. That that I'm not saying every individual in this country is, is great. I'm not every Jew is great either. But the principles of this country are absolutely Torah based. That every person, every Jew in this country is protected. You can go to any school you want. There's no decrees. There's no gzeres. Is there individual anti-Semitism? Yes, but not institutional. You can prosecute if somebody discriminates against you because they are Jewish. You can take them to court. Again, it's not a perfect system, but the principles are far different. And not because we hid that we're Jewish, it's because this nation learned, this American nation learned from the Jews how to build a country that's, that's decent, that's civil. Before the United States, you know, who ruled the world? Monarchs and the church. Tyrants. If they happened to be benevolent, we were lucky. If not, too bad. This country is the first country in history, and now there are hundreds like it, that established the principles that freedom of religion, you cannot be discriminated by your faith, religion, and the principles of justice, charity, chesed, tzedek, and yesha. I mean, I can elaborate about a lot more about that, but that is essentially the Rebbe's approach to a country like this, and it's actually spread. The Rebbe even once said in the Fabrengen that even Israel, ironically, learns from this country principles of charity and uh, justice. So, the bottom line is the solution, therefore, to anti-Semitism is not trying to figure out a way to hide, not trying to figure out to manipulate. You have to always be good with the non-Jews as much as possible, but to be as Jewish as you can, because that's what gives us our strength. And your behavior is not going to change them, because they have either inherent discomfort due to the mound or to the ditch. So when we stand up for what we stand up, like we did by Purim, and throughout history, the non-Jews ultimately take note and we get their attention and it ultimately creates a respect even though yet a love and ultimately when Mashiach comes the nations of the world will respect and an, an honor what the Jews are about today you go around the world you go to Israel you have the right for example the, the, the evangelical right wing Christians in this country are the most pro-Israel and most pro-Jewish you'll ever find more than any rabbi I don't know if you ever see in Israel, you go to the coastal any given moment, you'll find groups from Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, non-Jews. He asks, what are you doing here? Promised land. Why are you here? The chosen people. You don't hear Jews speak this way. So the world's a very different world today than it was. Are there still elements of anti-Semitism? Absolutely. Because the world is not yet, Mashiach has not yet arrived. The ghoul is not here in the fullest sense of the word. So of course we have it. So the Rebbe's approach basically is a very prudent approach, at the same time a very faith-based. What did Yaakov Avinu do when he came confront Esau? He saw Esau ready to fight with him. Right? He sent his messengers, Vayishlach Yaakov, and he come back, bad report. Esau is ready to go to war with you. What did Yaakov do? He davened. He prepared a bribe to appease him. And he prepared for war. That's the prudent way. Thank God he only needed the prayer and the appeasement. And Esau's heart melted. Completely, not completely. So that's the approach we take. Of course we do everything possible to be peaceful with, our na- with the nations of the world. And on the contrary, if we can influence them, like the Rebbe emphasizes so many times, to influence them to do their mitzvahs. What is their mitzvahs? Their mitzvahs are basically people dismiss it. They think, Sheva mitzvahs b'nei neich. Oh, we have 613, they have seven. I would tell you that if every Jew kept the seven mitzvahs of the Bnei Neach, Mashiach would be here already. They're not small little mitzvahs. There's basically belief in God. There's no, no killing, no stealing. And sexual, healthy sexual relations, not unhealthy. Respect for the environment and for other nations and having justice systems. It's essentially the Aser Sadibris without Shabbos and Kibodav. And the seven Shabbos mitzvahs Bnei Neach break down into many more, down to 90 mitzvahs. They're, they basically govern a modern civilization. I'm sorry, a civilization under God. A, civiliza- a civilized world. That's the Sheva Mitzvah. So that's our job. But we always know that it's Hashem that protects us. We always know that it's not the nations that we're depending on. Our job is to influence them. We depend on God. And when we do our thing, that's the greatest solution to anti-Semitism. Because we're basically teaching people anti-Semitism, racism, is primitive is immature, is unhealthy, and doesn't have any benefit. As we see, 
every nation that attacked Jews ended up attacking each other. It's not just the Jews. Hitler, had he gone only for the Jews, Rahman al I don't even want to imagine what would have happened. But he attacked everybody. France, Russia, let alone Poland and all the other countries. England. So it's, they, you begin with the Jews, because if you hate one person, you end up hating everybody. So that's what we teach the world. Hate is not the way. It's love. It's through kindness. At the same time, we're prudent. And here you see, and the Rebbe concludes in that Sikha Purim, Tov Shechafhei, that the Gemara is telling us an important thing. To know that this is that the Jewish people are either going to be a mound or a ditch. We need to know that. Don't ever underestimate. Don't think that you're going to try and make some effort with Mordechai, with Achashverosh or Haman, you can figure it out. You have to know that. And the solution is to be as Jewish as you can be. And when you do that, that's how you fight anti-Semitism. Now, this doesn't mean, obviously, you have to be prudent. You know, if you're walking down a street, like someone told me they were in London. They see a whole bunch of people crying out, dirty Jew or something. doesn't mean you have to just walk through them and say, say listen, I'm going to just do Tayyid and Mitzvahs in front of you, and I know you're all going to melt away. You have to be a little smart. You see people, the haters, you have to avoid that, obviously. Just like we lock our doors. We don't just say, well, so I say being as Jewish as possible, meaning in general, not hiding our Judaism, but living up to it, to what it truly means. So it's not about not being practical. <clears throat> this is generally the gist of the Rebbe's approach. And it's, I think, very fascinating using the Gebada, obviously the story of Purim. And it's a lot of lessons that we can have today when people ask these questions, what's our approach? So obviously at night in Crown Heights, you see someone that's going to do something on God forbid, you, just, you stay away. You're not talking about, you say, hey, I'm Jew, chosen by God, and let's put on tefillin or something, you know, or oh, let's do a mitzvah. We have to be practical. But overall, we don't hide our Judaism. We don't escape. We're not running away. And overall, we will have an impact, and we have had an impact. Because today, 80%, if not 90% of the countries of the world are friendly to Jews. Even Russia, which was such an enemy of Jews till 1990, it also crumbled. And today, there's a renaissance of Jewish life there. Again, we still need to be practical. We still need to make our plans. But we have to know there's Hashem our efforts, and ultimately that will lead to the Gula, when it will be like the Rambam Paskins, all the nations of the world will serve one God, and the nations will recognize that Beisi, meaning the Beisi Amigdash, is the base fill of the Kola Amin. All the nations will dive into the Beis, to the Beisi Amigdash. And all the nations of the world, like the Rambam concludes, will be a world filled with divine knowledge, Kamayim Layam Chasim, like the waters cover the sea, Mola Aritz, what's the Pasuk saying, Yeshaya? Lo yareu v'lo yashchisu b'chol har kotshi. There'll no longer be evil or destruction on my entire holy mountain. Why? Ki mola Aritz, because the world will be filled with Deus Hashem, k'mayim le'yam echas. So Chassidus explains, when there's Deus Hashem, when people know what God says, and you teach them what God says, that automatically brings to no, no destruction and no evil, including anti-Semitism. No more war as the Rambam concludes. And this is in our hands. So I hope I did justice to the Rebbe's approach. You could always look up the Sikha some more. Since we have a few minutes, if anybody wants to ask any questions, I saw some people raise their hands. Maybe I already answered them. Or maybe you forgot your question. But if you want to ask any questions, I'll be happy to um, answer any questions. I just wanted to comment that um, yesterday, um, one of our teachers showed us this, this um, audio of this rabbi speaking, and he was saying um, how because we're in um, Gaulas and because um, everybody um, hates us, we have to be very careful to um, lay low and like to not wear um, towels on the street and like all these kinds of ideas. And it was just very fascinating to see that that kind of perspective um, because we're so not like that. Uh, absolutely. And you know, listen, Jews for 2,000 years have been playing defense. You know, when you're defensive for so long, that's the only thing you know. It's the Rebbe that introduced offensive Judaism, if you wish. It's a big difference. That's why it's not just around anti-Semitism. In general, what did all Jewish communities do after World War II? They went and built their own communities. What did the Rebbe do? He sent everybody away, as many people as he could, to go help Jews everywhere. That was very strange, and till this day, still it's mysterious for most Jews. Because most Jews are really, you know, let me, after everything we went through, let me just protect my own house and my family. And the Rebbe went on the offense. He sent Jews everywhere. You can imagine what kind of 
uh, surprise and critique the Rebbe got in 1950. How could you send Jews everywhere to a world that was just quiet when the Holocaust happened? You're sending shluchim. And the Rebbe's approach was the best defense is offense. And that's a fundamental different approach than most other Jews. But you know what? They're, they're learning as well because they see. The non-Jewish world respects us when we're in the offense because that's what they want. They call us the people of the book. Christianity and Islam, you know where they come from? Judaism. I can tell you Muslims are more respectful of religious Jews than of non-religious Jews. They still don't like them because they want everybody out of Israel. But they respect them because Jews that live up, because that's where their faith comes from. Their faith all comes from Moshe Rabbeinu, who's their first prophet. Avram Avinu who's their first prophet. So yes, it's a very different approach. Again, I didn't say to go with a talus and film and start blatantly going in a group of anti-Semites and just to, to raise them on, to incite them. That's not practical. But on the other hand, absolutely. I was once walking in Manhattan, I remember for Shabbos, I was there for Shabbos in the Upper East Side. And I was walking home from Shul with a talus. I was talking with my father. We both had a talus on. And a woman who was just seemed to have just gone shopping at Saks or something. It was Shabbos morning. Like a, and she turns to me. We're standing at a corner. She turns to me and she says, shame on you. Like, you know, disgusting. I was about to say something. She for sure was Jewish. There's no question about it. I was going to say, but I didn't, obviously. I was going to say, you know what? If you were in a shtetl 100 years ago, they would say, shame on you for walking with bags. But she was so embarrassed. I'm not because of anti-Semitism. She was so embarrassed of her own Judaism. She's telling me, shame on me. In America, would she say that to a Saudi Arabian prince? Or to someone with dreadlocks? Or some, some other person representing their culture? You know that joke they tell Tversky, Rabbi Tversky was on a plane. And someone started mocking him. That he still wears a beard. It's a primitive. We're in modern times. So he says, why are you mocking me? So he says, you know, you Jews, you keep on holding on to this. She says, I'm not Jewish, I'm Amish. She says, oh, Amish. I love the Amish holding on to their traditions, even though it's thousands of years, whatever it is. She was Jewish, that woman. So that's why, you know, people are, like I said, with Haman, you feel the inadequacy when you see someone else. Now, we don't have to rub it in their face. I didn't respond to her because I didn't think it was the right thing to do. I know I'll tell you what I felt. But I didn't respond. I just uh, ignored it. And obviously, I didn't really care what she thinks. It's her business. It's her business. She doesn't have to tell me what to do. But there is an attitude that, you know, they tell the joke. I'll conclude with this joke. <clears throat> a Jew gets up in the Knesset. And he says, you know what? I have a new solution to our problems. Instead of fighting with the Arabs, let's attack the United States of America. They'll beat us. And then out of guilt, they'll rebuild us as they did Germany and Japan after World War II. So instead of getting $20 billion a year in aid, we'll get $100 billion. Great idea, right? A Jewish idea. So an old Jew sitting there gets up and says, very nice idea, but what happens if we win? In other words, it's very nice, but what happens if we win and then we only have 300 million Americans on our hands? What are we going to do with them? So Jews are very good at losing. We're very good at being underdogs and the defense. No one can kill us. That's clear. No matter what has happened, here we are. And of course, that itself makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But our offense is a whole new world. It's, uh, and I think Jews have gotten so used to defense. That's why, thank God, we have the Rebbe. Gave us a offense. Like, you know, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, many Jews, almost all Jews, united around the fact that we'll have a homeland in Israel. Religious, non-religious, except a few anti, real rabid anti-Zionists. Why did they unite? Because everyone saw after the Holocaust, we, you know, Israel was a holy land. There were different shittists. Obviously, everyone had different approaches. But now, when you say we have a homeland, you ask, I, I meet young Jews, tell me, I'm sick of I'm tired hearing from my rabbis and, and parents that what do we stand for as Jews? We're anti-anti-Semitism. And when I say, what do we stand for? I don't, I don't want to know what we're anti. What are we for? That's a hard, very hard question to answer for many. The Rebbe gives us the answer. We're here to bring the Gula. We're here to change the world. As we change it till now, we're here to bring Teirah, Chassidus, to make the world a more refined place. Many Jews live defensive Jews, defensive Jews, and we, thank God, have taken the approach of offensive, 
which if you think about it is much more, um, besides uplifting, also much more accurate. And we live in different times. It's not, this is not Nazi Europe, thank God. And from our point of view, we have the ability to reach and touch everyone we can reach today without limits. Any limit we have is internal, is our own, is our own hesitation, our own fears. It's nothing to do with any decree. No one's coming to arrest us because we're learning in yeshiva here. No one's coming to regulate how Jewish to be. You have complete control what kind of home and family you'll build, what you'll teach your children. It's miraculous. I think if our grandparents saw this, they would see it as messianic. You know, we literally live in such beautiful times in that sense. That doesn't mean we don't have challenges. Our challenge is the other way around. We're so comfortable, we sometimes lose sight why we're here. We're not even fighting for it because it's so easy. So that's our challenge, not to be apathetic. So there you are, you're the leaders of the, the new leaders, the future leaders of the Jewish people, right? This class here, your age. And we look forward that you will do what we didn't do and finally bring the goal in. Everyone be well. Thank you very much.